And I think that was the formula for my fame. Bogdanovich created his first monument in his hometown, Belgrade, which claims to be the most frequently destroyed city in the world. It's been ravaged by hostile forces nearly 50 times, by Huns and Avars, Habsburgs and Ottomans, and in the Second World War, both by the Germans and by the Western Allies. Finally, in 1999, the Serbian capital's two million population experienced a 76-day bombardment by NATO, the final act of the Yugoslavian civil wars. The most tragic of these events was probably the capture of Belgrade by Nazi German forces in 1941. The historical district of Dorkol, the home of Sephardi Jews since the 16th century, was reduced to rubble. The Jewish men were summarily liquidated in mass executions. The women and children almost all died in concentration camps. Of the 10,000 Jews living in the city, less than 500 survived the Holocaust. In 1951, Belgrade's Jewish community invited six architects to take part in a competition. The task? To design a memorial for the Jewish victims of fascism at the Sephardi Cemetery. Bogdanovich, just 29 at the time and only recently qualified as an architect, took up the invitation, albeit without much enthusiasm and more because he had nothing else to do. Up to that time, I had never thought of working on a monument. I thought monuments were absurd, which was not a very good attitude to start with. But when I got down to the work, I had the idea of looking at Jewish symbols. And that led me to the Kabbalah. To the interpretation of Jewish symbols, which I found astonishing but also engrossing. For Bogdan Bogdanovich, that introduction to Jewish mysticism was the start of a metaphysical approach to architecture that would define all of the monuments he went on to design later. as well as classical Jewish symbols such as the Star of David and the seven-armed candelabra, the menorah, the memorial also draws on symbols and shapes from other cultures. The central gate, for example, is formed by two pylons, reminiscent of archaic, pre-classical temples. From the front, the architect designed the stone pylons to suggest the commandment tablets given to Moses. But the outer profile of the two wings displays the classical proportions of a Doric column, which according to Greek stylistics, represents the growth of a young man. Their inner profile is modeled on an Ionic column, which represents the ideal form of a young woman. On the approach to the memorial, is a metaphorical fountain, a possible reference to the mikveh, the ritual bath of a Jewish community, or simply a general reference to water, 
an ancient symbol of just about every civilization. As in all the monuments he created, Bogdanovich refrained from making concrete statements, from sending clear messages. Even so, there is no misunderstanding the allegory of a gate at the end of a path, especially for a community in which so many lives were cut short. Bogdanovich tried to salvage stones for the memorial from the mountains of rubble in the bombed-out Jewish quarter. He rummaged through the ruins, instantly recognizing details of demolished houses and using architectural fragments to supplement the scant building materials for the Sephardi Cemetery Memorial. One of the few who survived the genocide of the Serbian Jews is the writer Philip David. He's ranked for years among the foremost figures of intellectual resistance against any form of nationalism, either in former Yugoslavia or in present-day Serbia. Uh, before Second World War, uh, Jewish community lived here in Serbia quite well. Uh, but uh, beginning of the war, with coming uh, Nazi occupation and a uh, uh, collaboristic regime of Milan Edic, situation was uh, awfully. And this part of Europe, Serbia, was the first part which officially was Judenrein, without, really without Jews, before a uh, final solution, before that action of uh, Nazis began in all parts of Europe, here was, uh, Serbia was Judenrein. After uh, the Second World War, there were not problems during uh, Tito's regime, communist regime, on the, on the surface. But we had no really problems and uh, anti-Semitism was officially forbidden to say so. I don't know what was under the surface. But with coming of Milosevic, uh, with raising of uh, Serbian nationalism, it's normal that uh, there was a raising of anti-Semitism too, because the Milosevic regime uh, was based on few stereotypes. One of the stereotypes was that there is international conspiracy against Serbia. And if there is international conspiracy, some uh, somebody must, must be behind, and who would be? Jews, of course. And now in this moment, uh, you have also such kind of anti-Semitism, uh, but I don't believe that anybody had a anything against this monument, you know, because when you see this monument, uh, uh, you really must respect it. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. Up until the civil war, at least, Mostar was a byword for the peaceful coexistence of the peoples of Bosnia. It showed that Yugoslavia's multicultural model could work. <laughs> For 500 years, the oriental capital of the Herzegovina region was home to Bosniaks, Croats, Serbs, and a number of other minorities, living with one another, not alongside one another. When the forces of Hitler, Mussolini, and the Croatian Ustasha regime alternately occupied the city in the Second World War, Bosniaks and Croats protected their persecuted Serb and Jewish neighbours on pain of death. 
The fascist occupiers' victims included a disproportionate number of young people. One reason for this was that almost half of the Mostar partisan battalion consisted of teenagers. Another was that the Germans took resistance fighters' children out of the schools and executed them in acts of deterrence and retribution. In 1959, the city of Mostar asked Bogdan Bogdanovich to create a memorial for all those victims. While working on his project in Belgrade, Bogdanovich found that he enjoyed building monuments. He particularly cherished the freedom, a freedom that was denied those designing utilitarian architecture for doctrinaire communist Yugoslavia. By the time Bogdanovich received the Mostar Commission, he had already created a memorial cemetery for the victims of fascism at Stremska Mitrovica in Vojvodina province, as well as a cenotaph to the fallen soldiers of the resistance at Prilep in Macedonia. But the project on the outskirts of Mostar was Bogdanovich's largest commission so far. He had nearly half a hill bulldozed to create the site. On the artificially terraced slope, he then constructed an entire necropolis, inspired by the elaborate burial grounds of the Middle East, as well as records of Etruscan settlements. One of the characteristic features of his designs is symmetry, which he sees as a metaphysical quantity and as a reference to the cosmic symmetry of the universe, to the duality of this world and the next, of life and death. Like nearly all of Bogdanovich's memorials, the necropolis at Mostar speaks to visitors as they walk through the complex. Even this monument is not sculpture, but a work of architecture. Indeed, it's an urban planning project. Paths, steps, walls and gateways make a frequent appearance in Bogdanovich's memorials, testimony to the urbanist approach of a passionate urbanologist, as Bogdanovich described himself. In the higher part of the necropolis are 630 flower-shaped tombstones erected on a series of terraces. 560 are for victims that are actually buried here. The other 70 are inscribed with the names and dates of birth and death of Mostar partisans, whose remains could not be found after the end of the so-called People's Liberation War. Bogdanovich thus created a fitting tomb for each individual, without giving visitors a sense that they are in a cemetery. The atmosphere is more like that of a cosmological cult site. Nowhere does a local community identify with a Bogdanovich memorial more strongly than in Mostar. That may well be because so many local people were involved in its construction. School classes, for example, turned up weekend after weekend with shovels and wheelbarrows to help shape the site. Traditional stone roof tiles, increasingly replaced by clay tiles in the early 1960s, were donated by many local residents. With their centuries-old traces of smoke and calcified moss, 
the stones were integrated into a monument that otherwise consisted of bright white limestone. Bogdanovich thus transferred the patina of the old city to the necropolis. For the people of Mostar, the memorial became a place of recreation, as the architect intended. People came here to take a stroll, to have picnics, to keep secret trysts. How we compliment the, the, the common habit? The biggest compliment I ever received was in Vienna. A young woman came up to me and started to laugh. Mr. Bogdanovich, I don't know how to say this, but I have to tell you, I was conceived by my father and mother at the Partisan Cemetery in Mostar. My father and my mother have been the Schaft of Partisan and Friedhof in Mostar. I felt extremely honored by that because it was a very archaic act. Even in ancient Greece, there were children whose life began in temples. The city of the dead looked down on the city of the living. What Bogdan Bogdanovich could not know at the time was that only a generation later, the city of the living would again become a scene of terror and butchery. And it is a tragic irony of history that the civil war in Mostar was to end at the partisan cemetery. TV journalist Zlatko Zadarevich has chronicled the city's history for three decades. For him, the memorial is very much part of his childhood. At the age of eight, he helped with the construction work. But the cemetery complex is more than just that. It also mirrors Mostar's recent history. When you read these names, you realize that Serbs and Croats, Bosniaks and Jews are all buried here together, but under the same plans that would divide both Bosnia and the city. This place was also to be divided. In March 1992, Croats detonated the first bomb here. The sound waves of the explosion struck like an assault on our community life. During the war, no one paid any attention to the damage done here. There were more important things to do, namely, to fight and win. So it was even more shocking to see the devastation of the memorial continue undiminished after the war was over. All the damage you see here was done after the war. I think those who gave the orders were neo-fascists, clero-fascists, trying to prevent the three peoples coming closer again. This desecration is the work of vandals close to the neo-fascists, who broadcast the message that coexistence is impossible. The civil war lasted four years in Mostar. In 1992, Serbian military units fought against the Bosniak and Croat communities that made up the majority of Mostar's population. In 1993, Bosniaks and Croats then waged war on each other. The climax of the conflict occurred as the world looked on. The Starry Most, the bridge over the Neretva River, built by the Ottomans in the 16th century, was deliberately destroyed by Croat grenadiers. Like the devastation of the Partisan Memorial, this barbaric act was designed to expunge Mostar's multi-ethnic, multi-religious identity once and for all. As in the Second World War, most of Mostar's citizens are said not to have betrayed their ideal of peaceful coexistence even during the Bosnian War. 
The aggression is claimed to have come from outside, brought into the city by extremists from other parts of the country. Even so, Mostar is now a de facto divided city, with a Bosniak half on the east bank of the Neretva and a Croat half on the west. The old stone bridge linking the two halves was rebuilt fairly quickly, compared with the time it will take for mistrust and hostility to subside in the city. Before the Second World War, the Croatian village of Jasenovac was just as unknown as Treblinka or Mauthausen. Situated on the bank of the Sava River on the border with Bosnia, it was the home of Croats and Serbs working in agriculture or at the large brickworks nearby. When Yugoslavia was split up after the invasion by German, Italian, Hungarian and Bulgarian forces in 1941, Jasenovac became part of a Croatian puppet state of Nazi Germany. The fascist Ustasha regime immediately implemented a campaign of ethnic cleansing across its territory and turned the brickworks at Jasenovac into the largest of more than 25 concentration camps. In operation until 1945, Jasenovac became a death camp for an estimated 50,000 Serbs, 32,000 Jews, over 10,000 Roma, and around 8,000 opponents of the Croatian regime. There was nothing industrial about the mass murder committed here. There were no gas chambers. Those interned were slaughtered, as it were, by hand, or they died of exhaustion, victims of forced labor, hunger, and disease. In 1942, the camp regime was even criticized by the Gestapo, Hitler had given instructions that killing methods should be anonymous. He felt that excessive personal proximity to the genocide was both psychologically and politically risky. The bodies were burnt in the old brick kilns, but thousands were also thrown into the Sava River, which carried the corpses as far as Belgrade. It was 1959 before Yugoslavia's political leadership finally brought itself to create a memorial at Jasenovac. It was the country's first admission that the Balkan Auschwitz was not the work of foreign aggressors. It was an act of fratricide by Yugoslavians themselves. On the Serbian side, there were many ideas for a monument from towers of reproduced skulls and bones to fountains gushing blood-red water. But in the end, President Tito himself decided in favor of the proposal by Bogdan Bogdanovich, a lyrical memorial in the form of a flower, a symbol of love and forgiveness. The Jasenovac monument is so obviously located at a place of horror that any attempt to reproduce the atrocities would have been ludicrous, sordid, vacuous. It had to make a purely metaphysical statement, and that statement was, life goes on. It had to be a monument to life and to the fact that the crime did not succeed, the crime did not endure. It was important to create an appropriate memorial for the innumerable victims, but equally important to express the fact that life goes on, that life matters. And life did go on. My speculation that this was a monument to life was often dismissed by party ideologues as pure metaphysics. 
But in this case, they were pleased with the metaphysics. Bogdanovich called his monument the flower of promised hope, the promise of a mystical return to the eternal cycle of life for the victims of Yasenovac. The original plan was to place more smaller flowers alongside the large one, in the midst of a man-made water landscape. But financial constraints meant that the two existing brickyard ponds were only extended, and only one 24-metre concrete flower was realised. When work commenced on the memorial, there was virtually nothing left of the concentration camp, so Bogdanovich confined himself to restoring the overgrown site as a landscape. He used mounds of earth to mark key areas of the camp. Concrete pointers to what used to be here are found only in a schematized bronze relief at the start of the long path to the Flower of Hope. The architect created this pathway from the last relics of the camp, the railway sleepers over which the deportation trains had rolled. The memorial was completed in 1966. The day of its unveiling finally arrived. Bogdanovich recalls the event in his memoirs. For some reason, the speaker's platform was almost a kilometre away from the concrete flower. The speech was given by a respected veteran a Croatian Serb who did not have a particularly high rank in the state hierarchy at the time. Tito was not present. He had a gift for anticipating unpleasant situations and had probably had a vivid vision of what might happen. What did happen was that the speaker gave the customary long-winded, boring speech. You could tell from the way the crowd was breathing that no one was listening. Suddenly there was a commotion the crowd, mostly made up of women in black with black headscarves, broke through the cordon of guards and started running over the open ground to the monument. Tens of thousands, maybe even a hundred thousand people, raced down the field sobbing hysterically. People stumbled, foundered and fell. There was a terrible penetrating roar and then muffled wailing that went on for at least seven, eight minutes until the crowd reached the monument and swarmed around it. It was an unearthly sight. I stood some way away, motionless, on the Sava embankment. Before long, the monument was as black as a honeycomb swarming with bees. The concrete projecting over the crypt, was designed to withstand a great deal more than the weight of the earth that was dumped on it. But no one could have dreamt it would be exposed to the weight of a crowd like that. The Yasenovac Memorial made Bogdan Bogdanovich a household name in Yugoslavia, but the architect and his monument also became a target for nationalist fanatics. During the Croatian Spring of 1971, for example, flyers were distributed in Zagreb calling for the destruction of what was called the Serb Monument on Croatian soil. First came the mistrust, the digs and innuendos from the Croat side. Why is the monument being built by a Serb? And so on. 
But when the memorial started to take shape, the Croats quietened down. Most of them realized that there was nothing vengeful about the monument. It was obviously better that a flower should be depicted than a man with a bomb or a decapitated corpse. Everyone could see that, but then the agitation started on the Serb side. It covers up the truth, they said, and where's the record of the crime? The Serb aggression directed against the monument and its architect came to a climax shortly before the outbreak of the Croatian War in 1991. Self-appointed tribunes of the people told the media they would personally blow up the Jasenovac flower, the symbol of love and forgiveness. They accused Bogdan Bogdanovic of treason and sentenced him to death. The charge read, who are you to grant them forgiveness? During the Civil War, the monument was indeed bombarded by Serbian units, paradoxically by those claiming to defend the ethnic group to which most of the camp's victims belonged. But the bombing was not just an act of spiritual outrage, it was also an assault on historical memory, as Natasha Jovicic reports, a historian who lost many of her family in the Ustasha terror, she's director of the National Memorial. Okay, Senovac was uh, occupied uh, between 1991 and 1995. Uh, Yugoslavian National Army uh, came here and uh, they occupied this territory. And in the same time, uh, the whole uh, archive, the whole uh, 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 artifacts from the museum were stolen, taken from uh, the museum uh, in Republika Srpska, so-called Republika Srpska. Uh, and uh, I need to thank to the Ministry of Culture and United States Holocaust Memorial Museum, uh, and of course to the politicians in the Bosnia Herzegovina who helped to transfer the whole collection from uh, Republika Srpska to Washington Museum. Uh, uh, experts in this museum worked for a year uh, on the artifacts. Artifacts. They stabilized the whole collection and they returned it back at the end of 2001. So since December 2001, we have uh, two thirds of this collection back. So and then we use these artifacts and documents uh, in our new permanent exhibition that we opened last year. One third of the artifacts is still missing. The Flower of Hope was also restored in 2002. A year later, it was reopened to the public in a ceremony attended by Bogdan Bogdanovich. But Yasenovac itself still bears the scars of the recent war. The Serbs who used to live in the village fled when the area was retaken by the Croat army in 1995 and very few have returned since. Most of their houses are destroyed. The Serbian Orthodox Church is deserted. In the now largely mono-ethnic state of Croatia, nationalist politicians did their utmost to blur the historical record. Even in the 1990s, Jasenovac was often played down as a labor camp, and even the memorial was grotesquely reinterpreted, as Bogdan Bogdanovic notes in his book, The Doomed Architect. Another salvo was fired by the Croatian president, Tujman, 
who had astonished the world a year earlier by stating that his wife was of neither Jewish nor Serb origin and that he was glad about the fact. Now he said that although he liked the memorial, he did not like the fact that it was created by a Serb. The memorial should be transformed into a Croatian national monument. He saw the work as a monument of reconciliation between Croatian anti-fascists and Croatian fascists. For a moment, it seemed as if the president had made a mistake and didn't realize what he'd said. But all doubt was removed when he said that the camp's victims should be taken to include many other victims of war including the fallen Ushtashi, who had created the camp and distinguished themselves as butchers. After Franjo Tuchman's death in 1999, the debate about the Jasenovac flower became less emotive Today, it's largely accepted as an ideology-free memorial. For decades, surrealism gave Bogdan Bogdanovich a chance to escape the pseudo-reality imposed on Yugoslavia by its political leadership the authoritarian communist regime probably played a major role in prompting him to focus increasingly on other worlds, other times, and to find ideas there for his work. From the early 1960s, as professor of urban planning at Belgrade University, he taught courses that persistently deviated from scientific doctrine. At the beginning of the 70s, as Dean of the Architecture Faculty, he failed in an attempt to implement radical reforms and immediately tendered his resignation. After that, he set up a private initiative at an old village school near Belgrade, teaching an alternative experimental course in architecture that drew fire from many quarters during the years that it existed. The teaching methods Bogdanovich employed some of them esoteric, some actionistic, were said to have aroused suspicion, even in democratic societies. In 1990, the school was raided and wrecked by political hooligans. After a deliberately engineered row, Bogdanovich demonstratively resigned from the Serbian Academy of Sciences and Arts, which became increasingly nationalistic in the early 1980s. Nevertheless, a few months later, he was asked by the moderate wing of the Serbian Communist Party to accept the position of mayor of Belgrade. However, his four-year term of office showed that his philosophical approach to urban development was diametrically opposed to the technocratic town planning practiced at the time, and even more at odds with the corrupt practices that are associated with construction projects, even in planned economies. The final rift between Bogdanovich and the Belgrade establishment came in 1987, with a 60-page open letter addressed to Slobodan Milosevic, at the time, Milosevic was in the process of clinching political power in Serbia. Bogdanovic saw through the self-styled saviour of the nation at an early stage and exposed him in the letter as a bigoted warmonger. He also admonished his fellow Serbs for their self-destructive nationalism and even made a stunning prediction of the disaster that lay ahead for Yugoslavia. Shortly afterwards, after more fundamental criticism of Milosevic and his followers, Bogdanovic was branded a traitor to the nation by the Serbian regime. By 1991, Bogdanovic barely dared put a foot outdoors. 
He and his wife, Xenia, hid behind drawn curtains in their barricaded apartment for fear of physical attack. In 1993, they finally decided to leave the country. Even after the Milosevic era drew to a close, Bogdanovich could still not return to his hometown. The last Bogdanovich memorial was created in the early 80s at Popina, a notoriously rebellious area in the West Morava Valley. Halfway between Krusevac and Kachak, this was the scene in 1941 of the first major battle between Serbian freedom fighters and the German army. In those days, communist partisans and royalist Chetniks fought side by side against the occupying force. As the 40th anniversary of that event approached, the municipalities of the area commissioned Bogdanovich to build a mausoleum for the first who died in the anti-fascist revolt. The commission came after the architect had actually decided not to build any more memorials. For the hill from which the 300 resistance fighters opened fire on the advancing German troops, Bogdanovich planned a four-part series of geometrical figures. It starts with a cube-shaped memorial stone with an inscription. Then a semicircular three-part gateway. Followed by a triangular pyramid-like structure. And finally another semicircular gate. As in so many of Bogdanovich's memorials, the view through the circular openings of the aligned elements is of an open landscape extending into an indeterminate distance. Agronomist Slobodan Yetvich lives at the foot of the memorial mountain. In the late 1970s, his father was mayor of Frunjaka Banya, one of the larger towns in the area, and was partly responsible for the decision to erect a major memorial. The monument was financed by the communities. The largest contribution came from Vrnjaka Banya and Trisanek. But people in other parts of Yugoslavia helped as well. There were donations from Slovenia, from Croatia and Macedonia. The former Yugoslavia was based on the fraternity and unity of all ethnic groups. And it was a land of anniversaries. We had an anniversary for just about everything. I was a young secondary school student when the monument was unveiled. Thousands of people were here, children, teenagers, and of course Tito's pioneers with the red neckerchiefs. I also wore one, like many youngsters in those days. <laughs> In his last project, the surrealist architect seemed to find a new modernist style. Even so, the Popina monument is still reminiscent of Neolithic calendar buildings, designed according to star constellations, the position of the sun and other celestial phenomena.
The groundbreaking ceremony for the mausoleum at Popina was conducted like an ancient foundation ritual, although the only one who did not take the spectacle seriously was Bogdanovich himself, before an assembled group of astonished dignitaries and journalists, he strode over the site with a long pole in one hand and a large pocket watch in the other, his gaze switching back and forth between the sky and the watch. Finally, on the dot of twelve, with the sun at its zenith, he marked the exact positions of the planned structures. The audience is reported to have been deeply impressed. If you draw and build something and you're bored doing it, it will be a disaster. Everything I built, everything I drew was a game, and the most important thing was that I felt good doing it. That made it interesting to me. I think my monuments are still interesting today, even for people who don't know what they signify. They were particularly popular with children, and still are. Lots of them have even become playgrounds. Kada je jučer bila, 93. Kada mi se usred rata osmijehnula sreća, Sudbina je tako htjela njoj me vodila. Moja lajla, moja ljubav, tad se rodila. Još je jučer bila djete, sada skoro žena Kao da je zlatnim suncem lijepa okrunjena Znam da će me ostaviti poći putem svojim Ali uvijek 